Tim, what are the good carbs that you eat? Uh, well, I eat as much as I can find. So, <laughs> so basically, you name it, I'm trying to eat it. But, you know, I, I make my own sourdough bread and I make sure it's got plenty of rye in it. And if I find some nice German rye bread, that to me uh, is a good carb because it's very hard to digest. So it's very slow to break down that rye. I'll have pasta rather than rice. So I still occasionally have uh, traditional wheat pasta, but increasingly switching to uh, whole grain, whole wheat pastas, which are, uh, are better for me. And then you've got all these range of grains. So things like lentils, quinoa, bulgur wheat, pearl barley, instead of rice. So they're, they're sort of little ones that people don't often think about. I, I certainly didn't think about those 10 years ago. So increasingly, I, I'm making these swaps uh, as I'm trying to move away from the traditional staples. And whole grains and beans, I've heard you mention, these are sort of the, the go-to yeah, things the replacing the, the rice and the potatoes and the bread. Yes, so we haven't mentioned legumes and beans, but absolutely, they're a source of uh, you know fats as well. So again... You know what's a carb source? Uh, it gives you the energy. The you, know, you break down the sugars slowly, but it's also got protein. It's also got fiber. So legumes are yeah. I I, I can't get enough of those beans and lentils and in in every dish I, I'm finding, as well as the classical ones. You know we haven't talked about the spinach and the kales and the whatever. So there 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 goes without saying, they're in there. But I think it's about the little swaps people can make to move away from the too easy to digest ones, the ones that give you those sugar spikes. I, I have to say the thing that I found easiest uh, is swapping regular pasta for whole grain pasta. And and I know it's really easy because my, my daughter had a, a play date yesterday and I gave them pasta. We have whole grain pasta now in house, gave it to her, uh, her friend who's never had whole grain pasta before, I think. And she just ate it because, you know, it has like, cheese and whatever else. And she's like, delicious. So that one is so easy to make the change. And I remember being like, really, oh, that's a disgusting idea. And I think within a week, I was like, oh, it's completely normal. So I, I found that very easy. Whereas I think other things are obviously harder, right? To re-engineer, to eat less bread, for example. You have to really rethink the sorts of food because you can't just get a... You know, if you're just always eating a sandwich, then that doesn't really work uh, as much. And so some things are harder and some things are easier, Tim, to change. Definitely, yes. I mean, so you've touched on on some of them. And, and some of these areas are new, so the foods are evolving. So you might have tried, you know, whole wheat pasta five years ago, but the new ones are actually tasting better. Similarly with the chickpea pastas or the lentil pastas, you know, they're getting better all the time. They don't fall apart like they used to. Another question we had so much, when is the best time of day to eat carbs? Great question. The literature tells us that it's the mornings that are the best time, uh, that we metabolize better. So eating an identical uh, carb meal, we have seem to have better control over it. it, will bring those sugar levels down quicker, digest it faster than in the evening. Now, the only caveat is those studies were generally done on young people, 20-year-olds. And when we looked at the ZOE data, we found that really this time difference pretty much disappeared after the age of 50. So the advantage is for young people, maybe less relevant because young people really, apart from possibly mood changes, aren't really going to suffer many metabolic changes from having these uh, spikes. Whereas as you get older, where it's more important, there seems to be more individual differences. So some people might be early, you know, better in the morning, some people might in the evening. So I, I don't think there's a rule. And I think you should follow whatever practice suits you and is likely to be sustainable. And so that's why I still have most of my carbs in the evening, because I, I know it it doesn't affect me more than the morning, and it's it's when I'm hungrier. So my natural body tells me to do that. So listen to your body, I think, is the rule here. And don't, just because some studies have shown in young people, you know, it is better. If you can eat in the morning, that's fine, but don't get obsessed with it. And you mentioned the, the Zoe data here. Is this a big data set that helps to inform what you're saying? 
We've looked at thousands of people's uh, data with Zoe who've done glucose monitors and clearly this, this age effect and time of day is very different in young and old people. Next question. Does eating carbs with other foods at the same time affect blood sugar spikes? Absolutely, yes. So what we're doing, with, if you eat it with other foods, you're essentially wrapping the, the, the sugars in other foods that are harder to digest. So whether they're fibers that the body can't break down or it's encased in fats uh, is really important. So that's why the importance of thinking about food in combination, thinking about what's on your plate rather than any one in ingredient is really important here. So uh, mindful eating, realizing that if you are going to have, for example, some bread, you've got no other, you've got no healthy bread, but you're starving, well, just you know, have it with some cheese or try and, and balance these things up so that, or you know, take it with a handful of nuts to give you some extra fiber. These have been shown quite clearly to change the height of the sugar spikes, which will then reduce the consequences. So it's not an absolute cure-all for everything, but it, it will mitigate in a way uh, that, that sugar spike. So you can start to balance it. And do you need to sort of soak the food in that fat? So, you know, I'm thinking, because I sometimes feel like, oh, I've got that pasta, but as long as I pour loads of olive oil over it, like maybe it's going to be like slower to, to break down. Um, does it need to be like soaked in it? Or can I just have the two, like one, you know, one mouthful and one of the other, but clearly it's hitting my stomach. It's not actually sort of encased. I think as long as it gets into your stomach, it will. the stomach is like a washing machine where it churns it all up. So I'm not a big fan of people saying, well, I'm going to uh, have my fats 10 minutes before I have my carbs in order to uh, get this, this response. I believe that generally our stomach is able to sort these things out. So if we're eating them at the same time, this should solve that problem. So I'm a bit against this obsessional eating that you have to divide your meal into 10-minute intervals, having um, your cheese before you have your and then your your salad and then your uh, potatoes uh, i think that's going a bit too far because for most purposes your stomach will treat it all the same and does eating like a sort of refined carb with some other food does that suddenly make it as good as eating a a sort of whole grain or unrefined carb in the first place no you can't uh, put sprinkle on a turd. It's uh, <laughs> it's still going to be a sugar. You know, it may be in wolf's clothing, but uh, w once that clothing comes off, you see what it is. And it's always going to be better to have those whole grains because you've got the original nutrients of the carbohydrate. You know, the bran, the germ, all these things on the casing that big food takes away. Uh, in those foods we were talking about, the good carbs, then they will still have them. And you can't replace that just with a few tablets or just a bit of cheese. I have to say my own personal experience when I was doing the first Zoe studies with you, Tim, was that I was wearing this blood sugar sensor and I ate a big pizza. And obviously pizza's got lots of cheese on it, right? So there's lots of fat as well as this, you know, sort of bread underneath, right, which is carb. And I think I had the biggest blood sugar spike in the entire two weeks from this big pizza. It went off the roof, stayed high for so long, then finally collapsed later. And I know that I don't have very good blood sugar control, but it did definitely make me feel that I wasn't going to just be able to put a bit of cheese on like a piece of bread and magically not have any, any blood sugar spike. And um, is that very unusual response that I had? Uh, well, everyone's different, but there's plenty of people like you and we all respond differently to fats and sugars, as we know. But I think it's a mistake to think that you can have unhealthy carbs like a massive pizza base and just smother it with all kinds of unhealthy fats and which might mask that sugar spike. But remember the fats, this is another podcast, but you know, at six hours, your, your body's still trying to get rid of those fats in your body and can cause more problems than the sugar. So let's not uh, swap one problem for another. You know, pizzas are fine. Have them every now and again. Enjoy it as a, a as a treat. You know, maybe have your salad as your starter, um, which does help um, prime your your blood sugar. But um, don't go too crazy on the extra fats. At Zoe, we know small changes can create big results. Subscribing to this channel is one such change. 
It helps us reach more people and lets us bring you more of the latest science on health and nutrition. So if this video has given you something useful, subscribing is the easiest way for you to give us a little back.